Plus, she started a new one, Soho Token Labs, so ask her about that afterwards as well. <laughs> and now we're having AV problems. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, we're good to go. <laughs> Welcome, Alyssa. Now we're good? Yeah. Sweet. Uh, so we are here today talking about securing your company's data, encryption, deletion, and other best practices. And uh, among my many companies, um, I am currently Chief Product Officer at Soho Token Labs. And I'm also an amateur historian. You can come back to my talk on women in Python this Sunday. And I'm very excited to be here in Australia. It's been my dream since I was a little girl to come here and to see the wild parakeets. And I'm clearly in exactly the wrong place to do that. Um, but I, you know, coming from New York, you don't really know these things. And I started looking up Welcome to Australia images. And I thought I would have like a nice Welcome to Australia like introductory slide. Um, but all of your Welcome to Australia images look like this. <laughs> like you're trying to scare me with like fierce kangaroos. Like this kangaroo is like giving you the eye. Um, then this one, Welcome to Australia where everything wants to kill you. And then I, I'm starting to feel more at home, right? Because I'm like, good, like this is security privacy track. Like, that's right. Like, everything is trying to kill you. And I'm so glad that you all understand that here in Australia, like already from your native, like, what is this? Like, sharks and weird reptiles. But, you know, I think then I'm hanging out in um, the quiet room and realizing, like, the threats and the dangers are like, advanced and many. The laws of mathematics are very commendable, but the only law that applies in Australia is the law of Australia. So coming here from, you know, New York where we've got Trump and I'm just like humiliated to like come here and be from America, um, but I'm feeling a lot better. Thank you for helping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling like you're going out of your way to make me comfortable and at home and unashamed. <laughs> What'd you say? We got rid of Alan. Yeah, so good job, congratulations. This is a step forward. This is good. But you know really what is Australian politics anyway? I, I put in Scott Morrison encryption and the, the top result, yesterday I visited Borello Cheese. So I guess at least it's not like trying to take the encryption away, um, although you know that's what got me on this track in the first place. And at least they are using Wicker, even if they're trying to make sure you can't. So you know, let's dive in. <laughs> this is like the face that we're making as we start to think and talk about our enterprise <laughs> security. Um, what are the ways that we can like really manage this? Um, and so the heart of my talk and what I'm really focusing on, besides being so excited to be in Australia that I'm gonna make jokes as best as I can and you're gonna correct me with what real Australians joke about as opposed to me just doing Google searches, um, is like trying to find ways for startups and for people inside organizations that are constrained um, to do best security practices. That's really what I'm all about. Like, how do we find and implement security practices even if you know, you're not in some idealized situation? And so if you're in a startup, you have the luxury of being able to minimize the data that you collect because you don't have a lot of legacy code you know, and you get to make some of these choices. Encrypting data is so important that it's worth talking about even if um, it's not the easiest thing to do. Managing access is really important. I have a lot to say about that, like managing who has access to the more like critical pieces of your organization. Um, I've recently become very aware of security awareness. We'll talk about that. And then empowering your CISO. So bring it back to politics and the news. The DNC thought that they were getting fished. Suddenly it's a national emergency with the DNC getting fished. And this is like, they're like, we almost got fished faces. Look how serious that guy is, the, the, the side eye. 
And it's gotten me thinking about that. And I wanted to move this up in the talk because I think it's so important um, that the things that actually end up hurting our organizations, like in the ways that we eventually get compromised, end up being just so basic, right? Like there's so many advanced things that we can do, but if we haven't handled, you know, training our employees not to like pick up USB sticks that they find in the parking lot and not to just like click on any link that comes in, um, then we're really like tremendously vulnerable. Um, and if uh, a serious threat actor is trying to compromise you, then um, these phishing attacks and other targeted attacks are very straightforward. Um, I'm right now in the process of trying to find like the best tools against that. And so if you have um, advice and tools that you like, we're going to have five minutes for questioning at the end. The one that has come to my attention now is Habituate, uh, run by Chad Loader, who founded Rapid7. Um, and that's all about bringing security awareness. Um, and I like security awareness as opposed to security trainings, because if you just train people on like a series of steps, they're going to forget it because they don't really like understand why it matters. You know, and we like shame people over not like doing all these things. Um, and so training people on like how to be more aware, I think is a good way to do it. Moving on, um, this speaks also to threat modeling. Threat modeling is really important because there's like a whole range of things, bad things that could happen, but you have to figure out like what actually really matters. And the first step, the first step is an encryption, it's minimization. Do I really need all this jazz? <laughs> So you minimize, and then you do things like encrypt. This gets to you know, data and data deletion. Um, for a while, it was just like really trendy for organizations to collect as much data as possible. Um, that's starting to get turned around as companies like Facebook are starting to face a kind of a backlash, um, which is why I put like liability. I think we're starting to see collectively like data as a liability, not only as something that's valuable, so some things that you may not need to collect, you know, personal data fields about users, metadata about users, their social network information. Um, and so I'll put this question out, you know, to the audience. Um, for any of you who've been building applications, are there data fields that, you know, you've had to build in your organization where you're like, we just don't need all of this information? Uh, so I can't see all of you too well with the lights. Could someone just uh, shout out if you've got some examples? data fields that like you were collecting at work, you didn't have to? Anyone? What was that? Mobile numbers. Mobile numbers, yeah. <laughs> Why were you collecting them? Right, right. Well, because it's easy to collect them, but now you have this data and you know, in the event of a breach, now you've got this additional personal information that can leak. Um, that's actually a great example. Anyone else? Anything else? Yes. So there's an app called Grinder that was saving HIV data. Yes. Not only saving it, they were voluntarily sharing it. I'm not sure if folks in the audience are familiar with this story, but Grinder was collecting this data, and then they were selectively sharing it with partners. Um, like with their business partners. And um, I don't think that the users of Grindr had like really consented to that. Yeah, um, so I'm pretty big on, you know, not collecting a lot of that data because it can easily end up being misused. Um, and you can have a responsible group in a company and then they leave. Um, so you can't necessarily just trust that the same leadership will always be there. So you've collected the data. And then it's time to delete the data. Like, minimizing and deleting go together. Do you really want to delete everything? I felt compelled to make this note, keep compliance and logging in mind. I'm sorry to be that boring. <laughs> Don't tell. I guess it's recorded. All right, everyone can know how boring I can be. It's fine. So yes. Yes, really delete the data from your servers, not just from the user interface. 
I'm sure that a lot of you have seen this before. I had a really fun conversation with Spotify, and I totally don't mind to shame them because this was really bad. Um, at some point, it was revealed that Spotify had shared some data with the FBI, and I was like, that's not cool. I'm going to delete my account. I've totally come back to Spotify because I'm addicted to all the music. Um, but I had my moments of conscience, and I was like, I'm out. And they sent me this. Um, I was like, what happens to my account data? I'd like for it to be deleted. Thank you. Everything is deleted. Don't worry. That was their like, official response. I'm like, I don't know. Deleting my account is kind of complicated. There's all these questions. Like, is there a record of the fact that my account existed? What happens if you know, I come back and I want it reinstated? Like, there are technical questions that are like, very challenging here. Um, but Spotify was just like, don't worry. Don't worry, it's good. Um, so, you know, deleting is hard. Um, and I guess if you're going to have all that data, you know, those phone numbers and the users, you know, HIV status, and if you like it, then you better put some crypto on it. So says Jesse Irwin, which I love. And it is well beyond the scope of this talk for me to get into like how to implement crypto in your organization, crypto in this case is in cryptography. Um, but I wanted to leave you with some good resources. Um, so some of the better books are from Bruce Schneer, uh, Cryptography Engineering, Applied Cryptography. Uh, these recommendations came to me from uh, Professor Matt Blaze. Um, and also, uh, like basically, a lot of people have been recommending Bruce Schneer's books. And if you're going to store passwords, um, maybe you can just avoid storing them at all. Uh, GitHub has a good OAuth option. Facebook, as many issues as companies like Facebook and Twitter have, their OAuths work really well. Um, we know it's some cost for that, but having to store passwords can be a lot. Um, I think one of the things startups can do is just figure out like what you don't want to have to figure out to do in-house. And No Starch has a lot of resources, like while I'm in the sharing resources stage. These are like excellent Python-related books, Gray Hat Python, Black Hat Python. And uh, moving on to more making fun of our government officials. The biggest data breach in the United States was arguably against the Office of Personnel Management because root access was granted to foreign nationals. Um, did this news make its way over here? Were they making fun of us for this here? This is like a massive data breach. What? What is the idea? Yeah, so the Office of Personnel Management um, is the office of the United States government that houses our most sensitive information. Uh, so for all personnel who have clearance, all their data is kept there. Um, social security numbers, uh, and massive numbers of social security numbers were released in this breach. But also, um, let's say you applied for clearance, and they discovered actually that you love Coke and strip clubs and you have um, a lot of embarrassing secrets um, and your Mormon wife wouldn't approve um, and you get denied for clearance, they also have that data. Uh, and so everything to make these high value targets very blackmailable. So everyone who got denied for clearance because of all of their blackmailable reasons along with everyone who actually like was currently a spy of some sort or just like holding a cleared position. So like the United States government's arguably like most sensitive data through a series of subcontractors ended up in China. Um, and so, you know, you, I, this is where I hope you'll laugh. Like it's really frustrating. That's why I've got Oprah, like root access China, root access Argentina, like everybody root. It's like, no, no, that's why like, this is the section of the talk that's about identity access management. Um, and when I was just a young, younger startup founder, I was just like, it's kind of weird how like we just all share all of the information to all of the accounts. And but we're always in these early startups, like you're always kicking out a co-founder, but like you never manage the access. Um, and then in bigger companies too, um, I have a friend who still was able to um, replace, I'm trying to figure out how to say it, like a, a top 20 app was not managing like who had access to like the app store stuff. Like these very big companies also are mismanaging these things. Um, so it's, it's just super important. 
you know, who gets access? I guess whoever has the beer, I don't know. I don't know what this image is like really saying here. But identity and access management is the security discipline that enables the right individuals to access the right resources at the right time for the right reasons. And this is like the most boring area of security, but I think it's like one of the most powerful because you end up with like the biggest breaches really come down to this. You look in the United States as another example, like you've heard of Snowden because that was so big, right? And like Snowden was really an example of someone who shouldn't have had that level of access. You know, the NSA gave him so much access, which was how he was able to leak all of that stuff. Um, and he was like also a contractor. Like he really wasn't carefully vetted. Um, so I think this this like really interesting, important area. Um, anyway, if you want to talk about that, uh, find me later and we can talk about like the software solutions and what it all means and mobile device management. You fire your employees, you gotta fire their laptops too. They can't access anything anymore. I learned that the hard way when I left a company. I was like, wait, wait, I can't log in and like deal with anything. It's like, okay, good, they did the right thing. So chief security officer, this is like the hardest thing to talk about because how do you hire a security officer before you like have the security people? <laughs> You know, if you have an organization, you don't really have the security talent, how are you going to figure out like how to bring in the security talent? Um, because that's really the challenge. And I think the answer is like hire a security engineer and like start building your security team and then they can like eventually bring in your more like your most C-level hires there. Um, but also you can bring in advisors. Um, so I've done that. There are a lot of like really great high-level security people who want to be helpful. Um, and you'd never know who you can get if you don't ask. And if you're trying to find good security people, you're welcome to hit me up and see if I can recommend anyone. But say like you have a good security team, you still have this problem where they're gonna wanna do things and marketing is gonna say no. Um, and so you end up with these bad situations where it doesn't matter that your security team is great if nobody listens to them. Um, this is actually a good time. Does anyone have a story to complain about this? You're like, half the room of you must at least be security people. I'm sure you've experienced this. It's like everyone's listening to the CMO. I've definitely seen this. They're like, yeah, we're gonna use these analytics. Like, you can't do that, that violates our privacy terms. It's fine, marketing wants it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but the CISO says no. It's fine, marketing wants it. Like, why do you have a CISO if you're not gonna listen to him or her or them? I don't know, we thought we should have one. Anyone with a story you want to share there? She's like, no, I want to keep my job. <laughs> I'm self-employed. <laughs> Some of us are still bound by NDAs. <laughs> Understood. Yeah, I'm very grateful for my co-founder, for the industry I'm in. We're in cryptocurrency. As long as we're not doing crimes, like, actively, <laughs> it's great. It's fine. Like, we're just, we're not under SEC investigation. I made our competitive slide and I was like, these are all the people who like have multiple SEC investigations or are actual mafioso. Like, should I include this? Should we tell this to VCs? It's just like, no, it's subtext. <laughs> they understand. <laughs> Moving on. Now this is just like cool stuff I wanted to include. Um, OWASP project has a hardened version of Python. I thought that that was kind of cool. Um, so not gonna shield too hard, um, just this is me, and you're welcome to stay in touch. Uh, Alyssa Beth on Twitter, Alyssa Shavinsky on LinkedIn. I'm obviously like super friendly and I wanna make Australian friends. Um, I don't wanna leave on the shill page though, so let's, cause we're gonna do some Q&A now, let's put it in a better place. I think on the books probably. So I'm gonna take a little walk, and if folks have a Q&A, people have questions, First, we have a thank you and a mug. Oh, <laughs> I love this. This thank is you rad, thank you. Uh, who does have a question? Or a story that is short and relevant. I figure we have like super talented people who've all come together here. I wanna hear what you have to say. I can't be the only one. Um, so were you gonna mention something about bug bounties? Yes, uh, and I had that at one point, um, but bug bounties have just gotten so controversial and complicated. 
Um, what I would say with bug bounties is they're actually a really great tool. I highly recommend using them. Um, I love the folks at Bug Crowd, bug crowd and at HackerOne, both like great organizations. But a bug bounty also isn't a replacement for like internal pen testing, whether that's folks inside your company um, or whether you hire external pen testers. Um, ideally, you get both. Uh, with a bug bounty, it's relatively inexpensive, and you're going to find stuff that you maybe don't expect. Um, and you can keep your uh, bug bounty people really happy by being personalized. So I had a good friend who was CISO at Silent Circle, and he would send out like nice bottles of whiskey, assuming that he knew that the people drank instead of cash. And it was like personal, and it was a sign of respect. And so bug bounties have like their own kind of culture around like how you incentivize and motivate and show respect to the researchers. Um, but it's not a replacement for doing internal pen testing, which you really should do, because if you don't do internal pen testing, then hackers will just do the pen testing for you. But like they're not submitting audit reports, so it's not great. <laughs> it's like people are joke, it's a free it's a free pen test. No, it's not. They they did external disclosure. A real pen test is like they tell you all secret like and you fix it. Um, does that answer your your Question? All right, let's do another one. Uh, yeah, over over here to your left. All right. Yep, yep. All right, right on the edge here. Yes, yeah. go for um, it. As someone who's been involved in quite a few startups and that sort of thing, I can assume, I think, that you value innovation and trying new ideas. And, and often that would imagine, like I assume, that involves software and, and coding, like new, new software and trying just new software and that sort of thing. So how do you, well, where do you think the line is between allowing people to innovate on their own computers, like downloading software off the internet, that sort of thing, to try out a new idea, and managing the, the security <clears throat> risks behind that? Yeah, uh, well, one of my startups actually was building like enterprise software designed to compete with Slack. Uh, and the use case, the threat model there, was employees were downloading Slack and bringing it into the enterprise. Um, and the enterprise leaders felt like they'd lost control, you know, of what was going on in their, their software stack. Um, and so I worry about that. Like, if you're trying to maintain security inside your organization, you run into a lot of problems with if you're going to basically, like, have rogue software. Like, you want a bit of control over that. Um, I think if you want experimentation, you certainly want to encourage that, and your employees are going to discover great things that you wouldn't think about because they know what their needs are. Um, you have to figure out, I guess, how to sandbox it a bit. Um, it's, that's actually a really hard problem, and that's one that I spent about a year thinking about. Um, I think at the end of the day, the best solution is for us to figure out how we build like, tools that are both secure and usable. And to the extent that we're eventually able to do that, it won't be such a problem when employees bring usable applications into the workplace because the secure ones are too hard to use or too frustrating. Um, yeah, basically that's like a really hard question that I, I don't know how to give like a short, concise answer to other than to say that like, I think the root cause of it is that these enterprise applications are often not friendly enough. Do, do you see yeah. it as a, as a big problem like maybe trusting people in the workplace that you perceive to be computer literate and that sort of thing and, and ha like do you are you as a security person with a security mindset are you yourself capable of, of trusting people with like things I think like we can admin? just say there like as a security person am I capable of trusting people and I think the answer is like yes yes I do have intimacy issues but um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and um, that's endemic in the industry. Uh, but um, I think it's really important that we trust our employees. Um, but the truth is, like, it's not about whether, like, I as, as a manager or a founder trust the people in my organization as people and as individuals. Like, I know that I sometimes mess up and click on something I shouldn't have to, like, correct for that. Um, and I know that, like, they're vulnerable by virtue of just being human. And so it's not that I don't trust them. It's that um, we all make certain types of mistakes. And so we need to like create fences that create safety despite like natural human error. Um, I think like security awareness training can help prevent some of these mistakes, but 
You can trust people and still know, like you can trust people in the ways that matter, but still know that like they're going to make security mistakes. It doesn't mean I don't trust them as people. Um, next question. Hi. Hi. Just here. Uh, you were talking about uh, deleting data. And yes. So you said how Spotify, for example, <laughs> deleted your account. Well, they said they did. Yeah, they I don't know. There was a typo in the message. Yeah. He said, don't worry about it. it. I never got any verification. But um, so what are your thoughts on companies who do delete, delete an account or delete personal information, but then they continue to exist in backups and things like that, or, or possible personal information in logs? Should we be setting thresholds on these kind of things, like don't keep backups for longer than X? Yeah, and well, like that. and you know, the American regulatory environment isn't particularly like useful on privacy here, but like the EU has been um, setting, like starting to set good standards. Um, so I think like regulation may actually end up being helpful here. Um, I think deletion should mean deletion. If someone comes to a company and says, I want everything deleted, that should mean everything gets deleted, maybe with a flag that says like a user once existed here um, with minimal information. Um, That's exactly yeah. right. So with, in Europe with GDPR, so customers can say to well, the company that I work for, for example, um, we want, I want my account deleted or information, so we can go and do that. But then obviously we have these backups that live for you know, a very long time. Right. With that information still living in. Right. So well, it's kind so of a problem now that how, how do we go about solving these kinds of issues is. Well, you have to look at like why would a customer want information deleted? And I might want information deleted because I don't trust the company to keep it secure. And so if I don't trust the company to keep it secure, that applies to the backups as much as anywhere else that the data lives. And so it seems really straightforward that companies should be deleting like across the stack. Um, and I don't know how we'll get there other than putting pressure on. Um, and it's not the most urgent issue of all the issues. Um, so I don't want to be nihilistic about it, but sometimes these talks help. You know, I was talking about Kubernetes and defaults and definitely got some attention in the community. Um, so um, Spotify and other companies, I guess, hi. Please delete everything like all the way. Uh, and I guess if you think of ways that we can try and make this happen, like you know how to reach me, and I'm interested in trying to help. Um, one last one. Oh, sorry. Mike, so that we can hear you on the recording. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I think that's a great thread on, but it's not just the backups that is the problem to be deleted. It's also, uh, if you look at big data environments like Apache Hadoops, for example, it's very, very hard today to do random deletes. A lot of stuff gets accumulated into batches. Customers today, most enterprises are spread across seven or eight different systems. So regulation is one point. I mean, that gets a lot of interest in corporate Australia right. here. But then again, that's also an impetus. I agree on, 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 on that as well, that it creates an impetus for technology companies to, to come up with solutions to be able to have that trickle down delete effects. Yeah, I but, think that's right, that um, sometimes this is hard technically, uh, it's hard not just philosophically, but um, the more that we have these kinds of pressures, like GDPR has put a lot of pressures on organizations to come up with new and different ways to do things. And so once the pressure's there, like we scramble and we find the resources and companies like spring up with solutions, you know, like if suddenly there's a real problem, then the money's there, like startups and larger enterprises will find ways to make it happen. Uh, and so part of what's going on here is there just isn't enough pressure from consumers or from government. Um, I guess that's all the time. I'll just say it's been my dream since I was a small child to come to Australia and to be able to come here, actually be on stage like the first day I'm here. I'm so grateful to be here. I want to meet all of you, which isn't going to happen. But thank you. Thank you for having me.